Now, where did I put them? Hmm. Ah, here it is. Welcome to the Toolbox. Tools for life and everything in between. Stuff you can use or toss, it's up to you. Hey everybody, welcome back to Tools for the Toolbox. This is episode 23 and again, I have another fantastic guest here that I cannot wait to have him introduce himself. So let's kick right off and yeah, get this started. So who are you and what is your military background? Well, hey, thanks a lot for having me on uh, Tools for the Toolbox. I'm, I'm super excited to be here. So my name is Jeff, Jeff Alpha, and I, uh, my military background, I was PBCLI for 10 years. Uh, Good old VP. You guys, just, you guys just had a birthday, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, one VP and three VP. Um, finished my time at the instructing at the infantry school, and I'm actually in in the reserve still. Oh, wow. um, yeah, a little bit more in the hobby category. Um, and then I'm in a, a unit called Influence Activities, which oh, nice. you know, hopefully we can we can bookmark that. But maybe at the end of the show we can. Um, put a little time on that because it is uh, an interesting capability we have in Canada that I, that I don't think that many um, folks in you and I shoes really know about. Uh, and it is interesting. I'd love to, I'd love to mention if we do For sure. uh, have time. And yeah. what I'm, what I'm up to today is I own a small clothing company called Jeff Alpha custom. And mm -hmm. our, we make a lot of clothes, but our, our signature product that I think most folks um, who will have heard about us, um, if they if they already have heard about us and they're listening, or if folks research us, is we make the world's most dangerous dress shirts. It is and a dangerous awesome. dress shirt. Yeah, thank you. A dangerous dress shirt is a shirt that is completely custom, but it also is striking and powerful, and really makes you a force of nature in any room it, that yeah, you it enter. I, now, I, had I don't a... know if there's video on this podcast if they'll actually see us. I'm actually wearing. Uh, a white dress shirt today. Indeed. Uh, I was going to say it looks a little on. subdued. Like you, there's not yeah, a but, lot but, of but, Yeah, but this is not the archetypical dangerous dress shirt. If you want to see that, you'll have to, you have to check out our website. Um, and I, I uh, almost feel like I should apologize uh, oh, no. for, for that. But I actually do also wear, wear white dress shirts, which a lot of people who are fans of the brand who are watching this show will be like, almost like that's sacrilege. You, yeah. you do that, but. Well, but you, got yeah, the, so, you got the so square, do... right? You're representing the, the oh, yeah. pocket square. You got a little bit there. It's not too oh, bad. Yeah. Oh yeah, I got some wild under the hood. Yeah. There's the, absolutely, uh, absolutely no doubt about that. I had a, um, one of the guys I went to school with was uh, uh, Peep CLI as well. He was doing his uh, upgrading course. I think he was CFRing. So he was like getting his diploma so that he could go the officer route nice and uh he I bet showed you up. i know exactly who it was if i can think of the time frame of when you were at school and stuff oh, I, a friend of I, mine. yeah would have been 14 no i no no later than that 18 something like that yeah i think yeah. i graduated in 18 uh nice. anyway he showed up one day in one of those shirts and i was like i knew exactly what it was i was like that is one of jeff shirts right and he was like oh yeah i'm like yeah oh that's awesome it was wicked yeah i'm and, sure i know who that is he was actually in this house not that long ago when he was on a yeah. task in gauge town yeah, super probably. cool he yeah he's uh he's a great dude he helped me get through a lot of the assignments because we spoke the same language right he, it was mm -hmm. real easy when we did a group project and he was like okay so what's gonna happen is you're gonna do this you're gonna do this you're gonna do this and i'm gonna do this and i'm gonna do that and i'm gonna do that and he was just like so yeah <laughs> yeah just, we speak the same language so it's nice to uh to keep working in school wise so you you were in for 10 Mm -hmm. Did you get out for a while and then join the reserves or did you just drop back down into the reserves? I actually went, uh, like, you know, my last day, I guess, right force. Then my next day was in the reserve force. Mm -hmm. Um, but oh. I, you know, I, I, my engagement at this, at this time is, you know, I, I parade once or twice a month kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not, um, like I am definitely engaged, but I'm not, um, so extremely active, but, but luckily, um, just with the nature of where my life was, I was at the kind of like, okay, I'm getting out in order to really get my business going. And, um, my son was born like a month after I got out, oh, yeah. I think my, my first son, I have, I have two boys as well. Nice. So I, I was able to kind of, you know, sp speak to my reserve, you know, you know, I, I'll, I'll join and, and I'll give what I can when I can understand you are catching me at essentially the busiest part of my life. And I'm getting out of the reg force yeah. in order to grow my business and my family, not 
to just sort of go full time into another yeah. military unit, right? Yeah. And, and they were like, yeah, completely understanding. Whatever we can get, we'll take, and whatever we can't, we won't worry about. Hmm. So That's good to hear. Yeah, it was a, a seamless transition. But I would, but you know, some people could hear that I'm not, you know, a class B, class C guy. I'm like a class A guy, very much a hobby. Yeah. Um, just scratching the itch know. a little bit every once in a while. Yeah, it, 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 exactly. And it is it is fun to to put the uniform on and and, and do a few things, but it's 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 not like being in full time every day in terms of my commitment level, not even a little bit. My focus really is uh, my family and my business. Yeah. Well, I got to say when I when I released, it was mm-hmm. it was all paperwork up until I had to hand in all my kit. And then once mm-hmm. I handed everything in, that was a whole not you're like years worth of experience and you're just like yep here you go you can take that and yep you can take that and then as you're doing it you're like ha ha i get rid of this shit i'm gonna get rid of that totally. stuff. <laughs> i think half the reason i stayed in the reserve so i wouldn't have to hand in my kid and cry uh at like the clothing guy's desk <laughs> yeah it there was a moment there really was when i yeah, handed in I my bet. i think it was my small pack that was the big one where it was just like but I don't want to get rid this. I've used this. Yeah. So, oh, okay. This is my blood. Yeah. It's not some other guy's blood. Yeah. Come well, on. there, there were some other people's blood on it too. <laughs> so right. Right. Those are another stories for that. So yeah. you, uh, the transition going from one day to the next, moving into another unit, but stepping off of from, you know, going from the peep CLI, that's a mm-hmm. high op tempo and you are constantly training, constantly working. I got a lot of buddies, uh, that are VP and, to switch to class a reserve in new brunswick new brunswick right yep i always get the east coast mixed up i'm a straight up alberta boy like (laughs) i don't know how fair um how was that like to to make that mental switch going from hard charger infantry to yeah well the one thing that does um maybe suck a little bit on that is you know, because uh, a, re- a reserve unit is like almost like a, any volunteer organization in the sense, you know, there are some guys who are class B. So they are, um, and, you know, it's the one or two people in your unit who are really driving it and are there and are dedicated to every day. And that is their livelihood. And then there's guys like me who, you know, every time I show up, I kind of got to get caught up a little bit before I even like really, okay, that's what's going on. Right. So if you're like me at my level of commitment, you know, though everybody knows it going in, you're sort of by by default, you're the de facto pump, right? Because because you are only there, you know, maybe one day a month, only committing such a little bit, right? Yeah. So you're always the guy who's getting caught up to speed or train or whatever. So yeah, of course, when you're, you know, PBCLI and especially you're at the school and you're training guys, you're the expert, you're the, the subject matter expert, you're the authority figure, you know, you are the alpha. And now I'm like the hard beta when I show up, especially because <laughs> my unit, I'll, I'll get into it now as opposed to later, because, you know, this is just sort of how, how the conversation went, but um, it's called influence activities. Really cool, really cool uh, capability, cool unit. And it is essentially the amalgamation of psyops and simic and, mm-hmm. and info ops, right? So it's really cool. Um, actually, when you say IA, uh, especially to infantry guys, combat engineers, a lot of people are either like, oh, so awesome, or like, oh, those guys suck. Like, I've really had uh, guys who have heard of them. They, they, you know, one way or the other, not a yeah. lot of middle ground. Um, and, and a lot of guys have a, actually a bit of a negative opinion. And, and I don't know if you heard about this. I don't know if it was a scandal. That might be the term for it. But um, one of the IA companies did this thing in Halifax where they made some essentially propaganda materials about wolves. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I don't want to like name any names or go too into it, but that's put a little bit of a black eye on influence activities. Although I would argue it should. And I would argue that it's proof um, that actually we need to train more in this. That would be my mm-hmm. line of reasoning and, and make sure that because it is a very powerful uh, and dangerous capability and weapon that obviously as we go more digital, we go more cyber, the world becomes a little more globalized, less you know bordered. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying you want the world like that or don't like that is just the way the world's going. Mm -hmm. We know that influence activities is going to be such an important capability. And I think we should try to hone it uh, to the point where we master it because we know 
that a lot of countries on the other side of the world are taking it very seriously. Yeah, and, and they've been and working using, those capabilities for years. Yeah, you, 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 using it day to day, right? So, but influence activity is super cool because you know how in the army, like once you're 30, you're like a dinosaur. Yeah. Right? There's a lot of young blood there, which is good because it keeps you young. Um, I, I would say like you kind of like have to be 30 to get into this unit. So it's a bit of an, an older soldier's game, bit of a bit of a thinking man's game. And, uh, and everyone, um, I think for the most part, everyone has a combat trade background, but everyone um, has a mother trade. Like you, you can't go right into influence activities. Okay. Right. Yeah. So if, if let's say in five to 10 years, you know, my, my business blows up and it's super successful and I'm actually like not working uh, like a bandit. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of different tour opportunities because you can actually go, do both influence activities or infantry, right? You oh. actually keep your foot in right. your mother trade as well. So okay. su 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 super cool. Yeah. Kind of like Sijiru, right? Like the, where you are technically, you work for them but you still have your trade and you still need to work your trade and you still need to be able to do everything, all the capabilities within your trade as well as the gyro. Yeah. Keep your cap badge kind of thing. Yeah, so it's exactly. really cool. That's awesome. I, you know, when people think of psyops, I think most guys think of, um, full metal jacket where right. you got the helicopters coming over with the loudspeakers and da, 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 ride of the Valkyries, a whole mm. spiel. And that's part of it for sure. Cause there were times overseas where, uh, some Yankee PSYOPs dudes would roll in just like <laughs> blast in Metallica. And we're like, fuck yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and all of the locals are going like, what the fuck is that shit? <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, but the traditionally PSYOPs is a lot of really behind the scenes. How do we control information? How do we develop an idea in the minds of the other people? Right. It's a, it's a very, as you said, a thinking man's game. I really, love the fact that psyops mixed with simic because that's such a perfect amalgamation you're working directly with the people and mm -hmm. then you can start to influence how they think or what they think about etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. that's such a, a great amalgamation and i think uh as far as i know i know uh the u.s ha those are delineated right they have mm -hmm. they have uh local contact people and they have psyops but to put those two together is uh, that's just a great idea. Yeah, you know what? It's funny you say that um, because of this incident. Like we, the Canadian forces, are just noodling a lot of different um, ideas, mm -hmm. and one is actually separating those two. Mm -hmm. Which um, obviously I'd honor whatever decisions um, you know senior leaders made, but I, I do think that. Um, putting them together makes a lot of sense for the reasons mm -hmm. that you just said. I, I'm very aligned with, with what you're thinking there. Yeah. The, uh, so let's, so coming from the school again, mm -hmm. like when I, when I left the school, I was master corporal Burles, right? The yeah, knife hand yeah. was like cocked. So, it was ready to sharp. go. Man. <laughs> yeah. Sharp. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I had this conversation yeah. with my wife at one point that, uh, she tried to, she was making fun of me a bit. And she's like, you know, that knife hand is just right there. And she goes like this straight up. No, people. I was, hair. Yeah. And I was just like, know how to wield it. I was like, that, that's pretty close. And she's like, oh, sorry. So like when you do this to people, I'm like, no, 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 no. There there's, it's gotta be like actually pulling a knife out. It's gotta be right here. And then it's at the person. And, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. and I, I had this like two minute conversation where she was sitting there going, why are you getting into this? Like, I don't, I was trying to make fun of you and now I, I'm getting a lesson on how to use a knife hand. Um, yeah. But in this 40 switch, minute lesson. Exactly. In a four minute lesson. Yeah. And we're going to, so my name is Matt Grover Burles and this is what we're going to be going over. And all the weapons in the back of the room are clear and <laughs> all that good stuff. How do you go from that, from being at the school of infantry, nonetheless, to making clothes? Because that's a, so, that's a pretty big leap. <laughs> It's it, it's it's a hard leap, yeah. And um, yeah, the amount of you know infantiers who are really into sartorial fashion is it's a pretty small Venn diagram. <laughs> I, I think there's actually two in the country, yeah. Um, and and they both work with my company. One of them is me. Perfect. But the other one used to be Queen's Own. So it's it's yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, what happened with me is I, I actually um, like all infantry guys. Um, dressed horribly for most of my life, especially my young life. And like, why would I think about that or care about it? Right. Yep. And, um, 
and, and like most infantry guys, almost took pride in how you know poorly kept I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I I had to get uh, I had to get a um, I guess like a, a an office job, okay. And and you might say, well, why do you have to get an office job? Well, I, I was in a, a business program, probably not too dissimilar to your program that you were talking about at Nate. Mm -hmm. And I was in university and I, I had to get an, an, an office job and I went to about 50 and, and not about like, like I went to 50 and a few more, like five, zero mm -hmm. uh, job interviews and I didn't get a job. And now, you know, I was 19 at the time and this was sort of like, it's a co-op job. It's sort of part of your, you know, getting your credits and all that type of stuff. Yep. And, and the employers know it's sort of through the, the university. The, the point is, is that these jobs are very easy to get because they're like, a, it's like a three month temporary position. I think it's even partially subsidized. Like mm -hmm. um, these are, these are easy jobs to get. And, and, and most of my buddies got a job for a second or third interview. And I did not get a job in 50 interviews. So you can imagine I was very busy. Um, and I'm sure we all know the feeling of, you know, trying very hard uh, and just failing constantly. And that's, yeah. that's sort of where I was, right? A lot of, a lot of input and no output. And, 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 you know, like people don't tell you like, dude, I'm not going to hire you because you look like a freaking idiot. But, but that was the case, right? I thought that people didn't hire me because I was an idiot, but it turned out the problem mostly was that I looked like an idiot. And mm -hmm. I, I went to my job interviews in this suit that I had bought. That was like, like this suit would be for somebody who was like 200 and it's like 30 pounds. Right. Okay. When yeah. I was 19, I weighed about a buck 45, like your classic infantry guy. Who's just, you know, a, a skinny pencil neck noodle. And, uh, as a teenager and then puts on the pounds in the army. Right. So, yeah. so I got this suit and, and it was just way, way too big for me. And looking, looking like a high school going to prom <laughs> wearing his dad's suit. But but worse, but like <laughs> the most exaggerated version of that. Yeah. And and so what happened is nobody hired me. And then um my mom actually called a family friend and this guy actually hired me and I worked at an accounting firm, but he kind of hired me out of pity, not really because yeah. like he wanted me to work there. Mm -hmm. And I sort of realized that I didn't know anything about clothing. So I went to this clothing store and I was actually going to see if I could work there part time while I was in university. And then I'd work like the office job during like the time when I was off. And anyways, these guys told me to beat it. But luckily they told me like, dude, you can't work here because like, look at how terrible you look in that suit. So I was like, oh, okay. So I went to, I went to Moore's and, and I, you know, I kind of did the same thing. Hey, what do you got to do to get a job here? And this guy was like, dude, like that suit's terrible, but you, why don't you come here tomorrow early and then we'll get your proper suit. And, and, and so I did, I, I went there the next day and these guys put me in this suit and I like looked in the mirror and was like, Whoa. Yeah. like yeah. James Bond, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is that I, I didn't tell you when I went to buy that first suit, I looked in the mirror and I was like, I could tell, but I didn't, I didn't really know why I was like, yo, I, I thought suits were supposed to be cool. I feel like I look like a dork. And the guy was like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with the suit. That's because you look like a dork. Like, like he was like, it's, it's you, not the suit. Right. <laughs> um, it was a suit, bro. Okay. okay. I put on this other suit. I was like, yo, James Bond, this is so cool. <laughs> and, and what happened was that was like the start of my shift, right? Yeah. So I put on this cool suit. I looked super awesome in my own mind. And I started to believe that. And as people walk in the door, they start like, people would just come up to me and they're like, Hey, I'm looking for whatever. And I didn't be like, Oh, it's my first day. I was like, yeah, man, let me show you this. And I just found that I enjoy talking to people about clothing. And, and I think part of the reason for that was, because actually for a lot of people, it can be very scary, right? I, I don't, do, do, you, do you own a suit? I do, yeah. Okay, when did you get your first suit? My first suit? Uh, yeah, very, very uh, first one. Not your second, your first. I think I would have been probably 16. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, you're not my best case study, but a lot of people will be like in their 20s and oh, they're going sure. to a wedding or a yeah. funeral, right? So now they're, they are Joes like us, mm -hmm. right? They're like getting their first suit and they're kind of nervous about it because they think that like the guy's going to be all snobby to them. Like, oh, you don't know, you don't know anything about suits, right? Mm -hmm. And and so people would come in and they'd be kind of nervous and I would enjoy taking them from like nervous to excited and pumped. 
right? By the end, they'd be, I'd be like, teach them how to tie a tie. They'd be like, oh, I'll tie my tie, right? Mm -hmm. And then, there was no dangerous shirts, right? I mean, I'm talking about navy blue suits and white shirts. Yep. But people were, they would leave excited. And people started coming into our, our store, our Moore store, being like, hey, where's Jeff? You know, I'm looking for this Jeff guy because I, I hear he's a fun guy. I hear he knows who's tied him out. He's got to work. You mm -hmm. know, so it was good for my ego and, and management liked it. And, and it was just a fun experience. And what I started to notice was that you know, my clothes were kind of working for me or working against me, right? When I was dressing very poorly and in clothes that were way too big, people just kind of treated me like I was an idiot. Mm -hmm. And when I wore clothes that were like well-fitting, especially if there was a collar on the shirt, or if I did have a jacket or a vest, people would treat me like I was highly intelligent. And I, I noticed that, you know, though my intellectual ability probably had not changed very much from the time I woke up, to the time that I put on a collared shirt, like if I, if I, you know, confronted people in a certain way, um, you know, I would have a better chance of things going my way. Right. Mm -hmm. Actually um, in my younger days, I was like a, a master of beating traffic tickets in court because I would nice. dress extremely well. Uh, and it always worked out for me, uh, which was probably not a good thing, but it, it would just like reinforce um, these lessons of, of what an advantage your clothing could be. So from then on, I always, I always just really, really enjoyed clothes. Of course, like all of us, you know, the war was on TV the whole time when I was in university. So I was like, Hey, if this is still going on when I graduate, I'm going to sign up. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And I kind of parked that. But um, when I would go out and us army guys, you know, we like to work hard and we like to play hard. Right. Mm -hmm. And we all, you know, we work super hard. We come home from, you know, 20 days in the field. And like, dude, even if we haven't slept in like 24 hours, like Straight we're all to the bar. Working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that that's happening. And it, and I would all, you know, like I'd be with everyone who uh, be wearing, you know, a little bit more dressed, like your dress. And I'd be dressed a little more like I'm dressed. Mm -hmm. And I found that I would just get a lot of, um, positive attention from everybody, whether it's, you know, my army buddies, just, just people around me. So I always just continued, um, continued just learning about it. And I learned a lot about the clothing business from my time working in it. And I just, I thought it was a fun business, but I, there's one other piece of it that I'd like to talk about that. Um, you know, I started to realize when I was in the clothing business, like you are selling to people. And, and, and selling and being in sales of any type is a really, it can be a really slippery slope. Okay. One thing that is beautiful about the army is it's very easy to be yourself in the army. Okay. Yeah. You have to do what your, you know, essentially your masters tell you, but, but you can wear it on your sleeve. You can be like, you know what, master of overalls, I don't want to run up this hill 10 times because you told me to do it, mm -hmm. but I'm going to do it. Going to do you it can anyway. Yep. Wear, you can, you can actually wear that attitude on yep. your sleeve and you yep. can be very real. And, you know, we have a very, like, you can tell your chain of command, like, I don't think it's a good idea. I'm going to do it anyway, because I am compelled to do it. But, but you can be actually very, very real in the army. It's a very beautiful thing. And you can't in a lot of other workplaces. In fact, in most workplaces, I actually think the reason it's so difficult for most army people to transition, um, if you're to like taking away PTSD and combat related things, yep. is the fact that in the military, you can be very genuine and very yourself. And in most of the civilian in most civilian pursuits today, you spend about 10% of your time doing your job and the other 90% of your time managing how you look while doing your job. You know, there, there's a lot of sort of gamesmanship and, and that, that, that goes on that just, you just don't have to worry about in the army. And, and so I kind of noticed when I was selling clothing, right, which is, you know, in the course of stories, a few minutes, but it's, a, you know, a few years. Absolutely. That one of the things I really liked about it was that people would keep coming back to me and they would refer their friends. Nice. And, and I realized that, like, I wanted to be, if I ever was in, like, you know, uh, I guess, like, the private world, and if I was in a sales-like role, it could be very easy to become very fake and to tell people what they want to hear just to make a sale. Mm -hmm. And I actually realized that I wanted to be in a business where, the same people kept coming back month after month, year after year. And then they referred their friends. I didn't want to sell like jet planes or a monorail or, or cars or something that's just like a really big purchase, but you only interact with people one time. I wanted yeah. to actually, you know, if I was to sell something, I wanted to make sure that it was something that intrinsically kept me honest. Yeah. Right. Because when you deal with the same people over and over and they refer their friends, like they do that because you're a good guy and you're an honest guy and you're a trustworthy guy. 
-hmm. a lot more than because you're like a slick guy or a special guy. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I was like, you know, if I'm going to, I wanted to set the conditions that I would like force myself to act in kind of the way that I would, would, would sort of want to see myself. Mm -hmm. And whereas if you're selling kind of bigger stuff, you can be tempted to take certain shortcuts. And, okay. and that was always really, uh, one of the things that I noticed in my early days in the clothing business. It's so, so accurate too. Cause like when you're talking sales, I did sales a lot when I, before I joined the army, you mm. can, there are like three types of salesmen. You have the super pushy. This is what you need. You have to go buy this, blah, 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 blah right. And that they'll tell you what you're supposed to buy. And you yeah. have the guys who will tell you anything just to get you out the door with a purchase, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't help you one way or the other. And then the last people who are there to get you what you need. Right. And mm -hmm. I was one of those guys too. I was always, I used to work at a video game store for many, many oh, years. Cool. Yeah. It was, it was a great job as a teenager because I got to yeah. sit around and talk about video games all day. It's amazing. Yeah. But it was a sales position. I had to sell to people what they wanted. And instead of talking constantly of like, Hey, this is what the new games are. This is what the most expensive ones are. This is what you want. Blah, blah, blah. blah. It was, what do you like to play? You know, do you want to spend 20 hours playing a game and be done? Or do you want to spend a hundred hours playing a game and then have extra stuff afterwards? And, expansions. Yeah. And, and then start going from there. Right. <clears throat> and the same thing happened. People would come into the store and be like, Hey, is chance around? And be like, yeah, yeah what's yeah. up? What do you need? And, and I'd be able to, and it, it led into, I actually, I sold like at the time, this is like late nineties. Right, I sold yeah. uh, Dollars back in the day. So much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I sold like twelve hundred dollars worth of equipment to uh, the British Bulldog. Oh, and that's cool! It was wicked. He walked in, and yeah. the the actual guy who was running the uh, the manager of the store at the time was a huge wrestling fan, and just like froze. Uh, I am guilty as charged as well. Yeah. On that front. Well, I love wrestling too, but I was never <laughs> like I was never a major fan. He was one of those guys that was like, anytime it came into town, he was in the in the stands. He like it was a yeah, big deal Maybe for I'm a him. little dial down from that, but like yeah. I'm tracking everything about the British Bulldog. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I love it. <laughs> well, <laughs> it uh, it just turned out to one of the guys went up to him. One of the actual owner of the store went up to him because he was a big name and was like, "Okay, so what you're going to need to buy is this, 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 and this." And he's like, "Okay, well, I'm going to think about it." And then I kind of slid in beside him, like, "Hey, man, yeah. <laughs> what are you doing?" <laughs> and, he, and just started talking to him, same you know way we're talking right now. And it's like, "So what? What do you want it for? Like, is it for your kids? Is it for you? Are you going to use it to chill out? What do you want to do?" And I would ask questions, and he would give me answers, and I'd be like, "Oh, well, this system has this capabilities, and this system has this capabilities, and these games are normally on the blah 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 blah." But it's the same concept of what you're doing, right? You're giving information, letting them make the decision, and you know clothing especially it is such a personal personal mm. thing right because it's mm -hmm. your style it's how you uh, ex uh express yourself it is it you literally are wearing your skin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes right? this is yes i heard very early when i got it's a really cool way to say it um that look good feel good right so mm -hmm. if you're you know um there's a reason why everybody looks fucking sharp in the DUs, right? Because they are mm -hmm. custom fit, built for you, and they are there's a regulation on how you have to wear them, right? So they look mm -hmm. awesome. And you see, so it doesn't mm -hmm. matter how much of a I don't know how many times when I first got in, when you have nothing on except for just the standard regalia that's on there, right? You got no medals, nothing. And people yeah. are like, man, that's a nice, like, ooh, all right, that guy looks good. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's so funny. People forget, uh, like military people, we obsess over you know this badge or that badge but like somebody sees you in your deus you're super awesome yeah yeah and it's a uh and it it also makes people immediately trust you right because of mm -hmm. how because of how finite the details are like i remember sitting with two rulers at on an angle on a perfect square trying to get my collar dogs like just mm -hmm. right right because i knew mm -hmm. i'm like okay that's gotta be and then i go back to the other side it's gotta be exactly the same most yep, people don't I, put that much work into i can remember that as well and being like yeah. i somehow need to figure out how to polish these things while they're <laughs> on because i don't want to do this again <laughs> yeah like they're just a little bit off you're like oh no this is and, not gonna work and yeah like you can see it immediately right so when you're oh talking, yeah when you're talking about suits and stuff like that like when i was 16 when i first one got mine uh it looked horrible because oh, it was, it wasn't a custom, wasn't a custom suit, yeah. right? It was just, oh yeah. yeah, okay, I'll take that one. It fits. Also, I'm like six five, and I'm 
at the time I was a buck 75, like I was yeah, I must super tall, so skinny. skinny, right? Nothing yeah. fit. I couldn't find yeah. anything that fits. So I just got something. I'm like, the pants are long enough. Excellent. Yeah. The jacket fits. Cool. Um, <laughs> and it looked horrible. I've seen some pictures of myself from back then. It was horrible. But the yeah. first real suit I got where I actually went to Tip Top Tailors here in Edmonton and like actually had it uh, properly fitted, properly and fitted and like, and I was like, yeah, I look fucking awesome. Like, and yeah. And, on top of that, the moment you look awesome to yourself, you start to feel awesome. That breeds confidence. That breeds the ability to move forward with your other ideas and so on and so forth. Like it, it allows you to mm-hmm. take that, whether you feel like you look good and just like, I look good, done. And that's off your mind. And I think that's a big, a big part of uh, why clothing is so important, but not only clothing, but just like liking how you look, so, mm-hmm. you know, fitness and, um, the ability to <clears throat> get dressed in any realm, right? Because if mm-hmm. you if you show up to a smoker with all your other peep CLI boys and you're wearing a suit and everybody else is wearing t-shirt and jeans and backwards hats and stuff, you're gonna stand out 100%. Oh yeah. Oh, Not yeah. in the way you want to stand out. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're gonna stand out. Now, same thing though, flip side, if, if you show up to a ball uh, gala or a ball or something like that and you're wearing this, that's not gonna not gonna fly either. And no. you know, I go to uh, my family's branding uh, down on my family ranch, and if you're not wearing, you know, boots and jeans and a shirt that is workable, like a work shirt, yeah, it's not gonna work. <laughs> it, that's not gonna work either, right? So having the knowledge to address the clothing to the situation is big, and we used to do this in the army all the time, right? Like if you uh, if you're going on patrol or are you doing a recce, are you going to bring your rucksack and a full kit and have mags and things and all kinds of jiggly right, janglies yeah. and stuff? No, yeah. you're not going to do that, right? It's <laughs> just, that's dumb. But if you're, work. if you're going for a fight, if you're looking for a fight, you're going to wear your armor. You're going to wear your, uh, all, you're going to wear extra mags. You're going to have extra grenades. doesn't matter how much noise you're making. You're going in for a fight. So it's such an important uh, thing to really, uh, to manage this in later life also is to know the situation you're getting into and apply the clothing for it. Because like you said, man, when you are, when you look sharp and you're in the right environment, people will look to you and they'll be like, Hey man, that, that guy looks fucking awesome. And I agree. That, that's my attitude towards clothing as well is, you know, just like we would, you know, tailor our kit load to the task uh, is the same thing. I, um, I think it is actually, important and appropriate to think about your task your day all those types of things uh and then and then dress in a way that gives you you know the the biggest advantage and uh you know again if the task is more function based right if i was to to go for a rock with my buddies just to stay in shape now i probably wouldn't wear a suit i would wear you know my pbc hoodie my small pack my rucksack and i would obviously throw on a high speed pair of boots and there you go. Right. Mm-hmm. But I treat, whether it's this interview, whether it's a, whether it's a media type interview or whether it's a big sales meeting, I, tr- mm-hmm. I, I do try to treat those essentially as their own tasks or mission sets and think, yes, what type of clothing that I wear will have an impact on my own mind? Mm-hmm. Because we all know if we show up to the lines in, in Mufti, which uh, for our civilian audience is a mix of, uh, PT, which is essentially like high school gym wear and our uniforms, there will be a very relaxed ad- attitude and atmosphere, which might be, which might make sense for what we're doing. But if we show up in our combats, there'll be a different type of way of thinking. If we show up in our DU, it will just like, if, if you have all of us on parade, say there's 300 guys, a thousand guys, whatever it is. And we are lofty, mm-hmm. right? We're, I, 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 I guarantee you, it, you, you will see a different, um, body language than if you were in DU, right? And it's because actually what you're wearing is actually impacting your own psychology plus the psychology of everyone around you, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I actually, um, and obviously, like, I mean, I, I'm in the business. I'm, I, I probably take it to a degree that is just out of control and maybe not even required for 90% of people. But I do think that that is a really, really important way to think. If you don't mind, Chance, I'd love to get into a little bit about, I know one of the things that you talk about with a lot of folks on this podcast is 
the transition, like, like how was the transition, mm -hmm. right? And for some people it's easy. And so for some people it is rough. Um, I almost want to get through this part. So it's not the last thing we end on uh, because, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, or, you know, I'm sure some guys may be mad at me, but the truth is, is that my transition was not very difficult mm -hmm. uh, when compared to a lot of people's right. Um, and I, uh, I actually joined to go to Afghanistan. I'm one of those guys who signed up, go to Afghanistan. And then I was in one VP when it was our roto. And then they were like, oh, by the way, the mission's over. I actually never went to Afghanistan. I've never been uh, in a combat zone, mm -hmm. which of course is one of the reasons why I pulled pin because um, yeah, you probably to fight get... and no more fight. It, 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 exactly. And of course, you know, what I do now is not as aggressive as uh, combat operations in Afghanistan. Um, but I can assure you that being an entrepreneur requires an aggression and a killer instinct mm -hmm. um, that, that, that one doesn't necessarily get from mopping the lines again. <laughs> so, so and, and I just need that. Like, that's just, that's just part of who I am. Right. Yeah. Like I, I, uh, I do need to be climbing mountains, if you will, even if they're psychological or, 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 or business mountains. Um, so that, you know, that need wasn't getting fed. Um, obviously part of uh, one of the things that, that, that helped me a lot that I encourage other people is you know, I realized I could see, you know, the Canadian Forces bus was going sort of this way and I really wanted to, to go this way, mm -hmm. right? Now, I, I, um, I did the JTF2 thing and the Seesaw thing, the selections, and I, it didn't work out for me. Um, and, uh, and then I ended up breaking my ankle, which kind of precluded me from doing some selections. And I, I, yeah. I'm not a... <clears throat> not a like, Oh, I'll just wait three years kind of guy. I'm like, no, I want to do something yesterday kind of guy. Mm -hmm. So I, um, you know, I had a, I had a tough decision to make and I decided that I wanted to, to try my hand in the, in the civilian world, you know, before I got to an age where I really wouldn't have any other options. Right. I also kind of had a little like, well, you know, I, I've been in 10 years, right. If I, if I kind of stay, I'm, I'm sort of chasing the pension and not really, thinking like, like proactively, yeah. I'm just sort of like, well, I'll hang into the pension and then I'll do that. And, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that thinking, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to make sure that I got up every morning with, with something that was on, on my agenda. Yeah. Right. And, you know, going to Afghanistan, that was on my agenda, going to Latvia just wasn't on my agenda no. and there's nothing wrong with going to Latvia, but you got to understand the fundamental difference. It, it wasn't on my to-do list. Yeah. It just wasn't right. Um, where, you know, creating and building a business out of nothing, creating a brand out of nothing, like that's on my agenda. And that's, mm -hmm. in my opinion, was a, a worthwhile goal. So I think that one thing that can really help with the transition is understanding ahead of time that like it's happening. It might happen at your five-year mark, your 10-year mark, your 25-year mark, but like there's just no way you're going to stop that train, right? And so since it is happening, you know, do the exercise. Like, well, if you could do, if you were never in the army ever, and you hadn't gone that road, what would you have done if you could choose? And, and for me, it, it was start a clothing empire. Like that, that's what I want to do. And I want to, I want to like have my own clothing stores and I, and I want to like just surprise people. You know, when I have tons of stores, I want to just show up at like the LA store one day and someone's like, yo, Jeff, I'll pop oh, no, Jeff's here. Oh my God. You, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and I just hang out and help them. <laughs> You know, with their clothes like everyone else. I was like, I, I had these kinds of, of crazy ideas. And, um, you know, like a lot of army guys, I'm not necessarily the smartest guy, but I, I just kind of picked something and I thought a lot about it in maybe my, the later end of my military time. And just as you think about something, you kind of start to make certain connections and you start, yeah. as you kind of just mention it to people, people say, oh, you should talk to that guy, right? Um, so the, the key is, is kind of just thinking or, or the key for me, sorry, was just thinking about what I might want, uh, post army, like may, maybe a little bit before I turn in my rucksack, Yeah. You, yeah. You, you know, so, so, so that, that helped me a lot is just like being really proactive and in, in what I think the next step, uh, looks like. And though, you know, I, um, I, like we won't talk about this process, but you can imagine where I, at one point I did see myself being in the military for life and. And, and hopefully being part of a can soft unit. Mm -hmm. And when that didn't work out, it was massively disappointing. Something I thought about every day uh, for years, but just because I really wanted that, I did have to accept that it wasn't going to be. So I had to make something, Absolutely. something different. And I think sometimes 
uh, people can wrap up in like, but what if this, what if this, like, dude, if it's not going to be that make something different. Yeah, Cause it's just it, like, it's, there's just no way to reverse the course of the train sometime. You're, you're, um, you're hundred percent right. And you know, the, the one thing I wanted to say is that everyone's transition is different first off, right? Like, mm. and the reason I talk about transition specifically is because that we all have, like, I had a, I had an actually really good transition, surprisingly, with the amount of stuff that I had to deal with, um, medically released and trying to get the VA sorted out and trying to do all those other stuff. I, I was lucky that I was in Meaford. And I've said this many times before was that I had a VA rep in Meaford and I was the only guy releasing at that time. So right. (laughs) <laughs> like it was time and attention for you. Here you go. This sign this, sign this, sign this, sign this, sign this. We're gonna apply for this. We're gonna apply for that. We're gonna apply for everything. Do whatever you can, right? And so I go around, you know, saying I, I had a good, uh, a really good transition. But everybody should have a good transition, right? So when we talk about transition, it should be what you experience. It should be what I experience. But unfortunately, guys don't get that experience. So I why I like to talk about it specifically is that everybody has a little piece for it. Everybody's got a little piece to make a little bit better. Everybody's got another challenge. And <clears throat> pre-planning is such a, a great tenant in everything, right? If, if you, that's why the you, army's preaching all the time, right? Exactly. Like plan, 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 plan. You gotta, got one directive. Here's your objective. Take this. What do you do? You make three COAs, right? Mm-hmm. Every time. I, you, I would argue, I myself, if I give myself and we have time to go in all these examples, like a self criticism <laughs> of today is, you know, the army gives you such a good planning framework that eventually you just start planning automatically. You're always, mm-hmm. you can, you can hastily plan. Yep. I, unfortunately, I would argue have been like, so hastily planning for so long and it has been working out. I've been forgetting that I need to actually go back to the drawing board and actually do sort of that deliberate combat estimate, even though we know mm-hmm. it takes like 24 hours to even do a simple mission one when you do every yep. single step, but it really is good. Um, good for your mind it's it's good and bad too because my wife gets me with this all the time is that because i'm always planning i'm like always planning there's always yeah. something to, 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 and i'm also the uh i'm the national one of the national coordinators for the canadian walk for veterans and oh, cool. uh, that's like always on my mind it's yeah. anytime like oh i should talk to that guy you know like <laughs> yeah. i'll just see him see somebody randomly online and be like oh I, sh- I should email that guy right now so that i can yeah. do those next steps but i'm doing that while I'm hanging out with my wife or while I'm hanging out with my kids. And she's like, no, 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 You got to rein it back in a little bit, but you, so you're right. It's, it's a great tool to have, to be able to make those hasty plans to be able to just uh, jump on the ball and roll with it. But there's also times where you need to put it away and be like, okay, yeah. not the time right now. This isn't going to work. And you know, one of those things is like when you get an idea, when you all of a sudden, like it's in your head, you're like, ah, oh, yeah, okay. I'm going to do that. And then you want to put it into action. For me, I have to have a very linear step by step by step by step. Okay, I'm going to do this. And so like for me, when I was, uh, the reason I went to school is I wanted to start a, an equine retreat for vets cool. and stuff. So we could have horses and work out in the mountains. And I, I personally, I was like, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? Hang out with horses in the mountains. Okay, how do I make that a job? <laughs> so yeah. it's like well get other vets out there and make it a retreat and get guys feeling better mm-hmm. and hanging out in the mountains so i was like well what do i need to do well i would need to make sure that i have the right qualifications okay well my qualifications are x y and z i need to go to school for x and y and i need to go talk to a trainer for z and i need blah 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 blah, blah. right and i start picking it away at them i'm gonna do that one and then i'm gonna do that one then i'm gonna do that one for yeah. for yourself how do you find when you're doing your uh, when you're formulating your ideas and how putting them into an action plan? How do you do that? I do. I do the same way. Yeah, like I'm not sure. Just like you, I uh, and I, I think a lot of guys in the army are. You know, we like pictures more than we like words, and we like a one, two, three sort of sequence. Like if we can do it consecutively as opposed to concurrently. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you know, because consecutively it's just easier. Uh, so, so that's how I did it. And, and, you know, when it came to the clothing company, I, I remember at first, like what I needed was a brand established, right? I felt like I, I, I needed people to know who I was. Um, okay. I need to be able to actually make the product. Okay. I need, 
right? There's all these things that you need, right? And so, okay, well, you know, here's a, like, here's all these things that I think I should need to be able to do on a piece of paper. Well, what's the first one? Well, the first one is I need to be able to make the product. Okay. Like, so I got to, I got to do that. I got to make some relationships with some suppliers. So mm-hmm. I'm going to do that. And the second thing is I need to have a brand. Well, it's going to be tough to do that because I don't really know how to like make a website and stuff like that. So I actually need to dedicate, but it's probably not that hard. So I need to dedicate some time learning how to do that stuff. Right. Uh, I'm not going to have a, a brand if people don't buy the product. So, you know, what I did, um, for like one of my things, I actually called, um, like all my friends and really everyone who like, I even had their phone number. I was mm-hmm. like, Hey man, I'm going to start this awesome clothing company. You know, my shirts are going to be this and they'll be awesome. It'll be really expensive right now. I'm going to give you one for $75, right? I was actually losing money on the every shirt when I first started, but it didn't matter. Cause I was just calling like my buddies, you know, like, yeah. Hey man, how, how you doing? Can you just buy one so that we can like see like, does the quality work? Does the process work? Does the, you know, all that type of stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. We were lucky that things did work out pretty well right off the bat. But if they didn't, I would have just retooled it, you know, called a different batch of people. But, but you know, really the same way is like, okay, what's, what's every, like, what, what's my end state and what's everything that has to happen to get there? Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, unlike the army, I don't have 30 people paid to show up and do what I tell them. I have just me. So I'm yeah. going to eat this elephant one bite at a time. Yeah. So now one of the things that biggest challenges I find for, you know, not just the ideation stage, but putting into action is like you said if if it's an elephant right if it's a huge friggin' task you can get lost in the the grandiose work right like i want to build a brand and then you're like okay well in order to build a brand i need to have so many followers on social media or i need to have so many people coming back and it you can get lost in the how large of a scale it is you need to do right right so one of those challenges is like just beginning just getting started that first step okay well i need to get yeah. you know as you said uh, i need to talk to some suppliers and see if i can actually make the product that's got to be your first step but even before that that concept right understanding that you need to have a product to sell <laughs> is mm-hmm. that's a big step for a lot of people so what do you think the the major challenges you had in like actually getting started what were those the the most difficult portions when at the time when i first got started with the business which might the answer might be a little bit different um you know it was just my wife and i my wife and i started the company uh, together sort of you know shoulder to shoulder mm-hmm. um i well one thing that was probably made it easier is i only really knew um i knew like one way of doing things right i had worked the floor of clothing stores and mm-hmm. i um i didn't know a lot about websites i didn't know a lot about e-commerce like i i didn't know a lot about social media right now the army is all about social media right even the joes everyone's on social media not that long ago when you and i were both in like your chain of command would be like yo you're on facebook maybe you should get rid of that like that mm-hmm. like like facebook was not cool and if you look at our service like i have like maybe three pictures from me in uniform right now guys are taking like 10 pictures a day back then like having your phone on the lines wasn't really that yeah. wasn't cool right mm-hmm. um taking sort of like hero shots wasn't really cool and now obviously i'm a big marketer i probably should have done that um because obviously it's like way more jacked and tanned and it would have just like gone well but whatever <laughs> um but any, anyway it's like the point the point is it's like you know i actually didn't have so much analysis paralysis back then because i knew that i could explain the benefits of clothing to people who like clothing and care about people one-on-one face-to-face so i just went to a lot of networking like so for the supplier thing luckily i knew a lot about the back end and the business end from my time mm-hmm. in the business so I, I probably the boldest step i took was I actually just like went to asia and just met with a bunch of suppliers and you can imagine you know nine out of ten of those meetings did not go very well um and i think that's actually one of the things that gives people you know, like you and I have an advantage in today's age, everyone is so afraid of being rejected and being told no and having people make fun of them, especially mm-hmm. now where like someone can like, you can imagine how many people screen cap me and write like what a freaking idiot or clown or loser this guy is, right? Like, yeah. like, and everyone's like so afraid about what everyone is going to say. Um, I'm lucky. I've just like always kind of been like, okay, does, does getting what I want outweigh yeah. some like social anxiety from some guy I've never even met before, like probably yes. So yeah, I just went to Asia, um, on a leave block 
as you do and, and made a lot of relationships. Uh, most of them, you know, didn't go anywhere or didn't pan out, but, but a couple of them did. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of times we can get it. We, we forget to like, if, if you fail 99 times, but one works out, like nobody really cares what your fail ratio is. Like all that yep. matters is that it, like, you're just kind of going for one. Right. And so, okay. I was able to build a supply relationship that also built my confidence a lot though. Right. Because I was kind of like, like how many people would really say, you know what, I think, um, I'm going to be like, you know, a boss fashion designer in five years. And just like, so what I'm going to do is in a month from now, I'm going to go to Asia for three weeks and just sort this out. And, and as much as like getting that piece sorted meant nothing, right. That literally meant like, okay, now you're in grade nine, you get to yeah. start. But mm-hmm. I mean, how many people have, have thought, Oh, it'd be cool to make a product or be a clothing designer, like probably millions. How many people would even take that step? Right. Yep. Um, so, you, you know, it's just kind of like getting up and going to the gym in the morning. Right. Like sometimes you tell yourself just go for 10 minutes, but you end up staying for an hour because like, like, like once you start, like you've kind of done the hard part. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I just called a lot of my friends. And like I said, I, I said, Hey, buy a shirt, buy it for next to nothing, but do this for me. Cause I want to test this website. I want to test my measuring process. I want to test my sales process. I want to do all this stuff. And then I want, you know, you to take pictures and put on Facebook and help me blow up my brand. Right. And, you know, once a hundred people did that, I also kind of felt like, you know, even if this dies, like how many, like right here, how many people would even get that far? Yeah. You know, many. I still have lots of friends today who, you know, will tell me, they'll be like, man, because I called about 300 people. Like, I actually made a list in Excel of, like, yeah. a lot of names. And a lot of people would tell me, like, yo, man, when you first called, and you're like, yo, I need to buy some shirts right now. I was like, like, is this guy insane just calling me up and leveraging our friendship? <laughs> <Out of> nowhere. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, like, he's got a multi-level marketing thing. He just needs to cram it on my face. And now, they're like, you know what, I'm actually really grateful that, like you gave me the honor of being like one of the first, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so a- a- anyways, but that gave me a lot of confidence. People bought it and whatever, and then they liked it. And then I think the TSN turning point was I, um, I-, I went to some networking events nearby and mm-hmm. people liked the clothes that I was wearing. And then, and, and then they just came to my condo and, and I measured them up and they bought some shirts and stuff. And then it, and then um, it kind of just felt like, okay, people I don't even know are, are, are getting it, you, you know? Yeah. So I, I'm trying to distill what the principle is, but I think the principle is like, you know, just do one thing. And then if you do that, you'll probably do the next thing. And then you'll probably do the next thing. And the next thing you know, you've kind of done five things that yeah. like, even if you fail at that point. Well, you're already ahead. Right? You're, you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're still a guy who failed doing something and yeah. not like the 99.99% of people who like, like live in the Twitter uh, yeah. comment section, you yeah. know? So, you know, I liken it to, um, when we went through training, right? When you start yeah. basic, you don't know fucking yeah. anything, right? How many times right. did you, how many times did you fuck up uh, a drill maneuver? Yeah. A, a lot. million, right? Anytime yeah. that anybody says that they can do a left incline on the March, fuck oh. you. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not... I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to attempt one today, brother. No, but, but it's the same point, right? Like you, you try and you fuck it up mm-hmm. and then you get corrected and then you try again and then you fuck it up and then you like, you just keep going. And then the people that make those type of maneuvers at, they make them look fucking easy, right? That's all you see. You see it at a drill competition or something like that. And you watch them march around. And you're like, fuck, look at those guys. But you don't see the million fucking failures before that. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's every, every step of the way we did the same thing. How many times have you fucked up a, a reload drill or, mm-hmm. um, you know, you put too much weight in the bottom of your pack instead of in the middle of your pack. And then you did your rock march and you're like, Oh God, my back the whole time. Mm-hmm. Right. Like it's, it's a step-by-step process and it's just like anything else you have to fail. You then have to look back and go, why did I fail? And then fix it. It's, yeah. Yeah. That constant like AAR process. Right. Yeah. So a lot of guys also, you know, a lot of guys I know when we get out of the army, we're like, fuck having a boss. Screw that noise. I'm <laughs> not letting anybody tell me what to do any anytime ever again. Fuck that right. noise. And they want to start their own business. They want to get involved in, uh, they want to, you know, just ha- not, they want to be the boss and they don't want people telling them what to do anymore because 
well, after years of being in the army of having people tell you what to do, you don't want to do that anymore, but yeah, it can get tiring. Yeah. Sure. And you know, being your own boss comes with a lot of great things, right? You get to make your own hours. You get to make your own thing. One of the things that always, um, that kind of stuck close to my heart was the fact that my success and failure was based on my own prerogative, right? Like that was the big one was that yeah. no matter what, it's up to me, not up mm -hmm. to the other guys in that section who are supposed to link up with us at this point in time, but don't, right? That's not mm -hmm. mission yeah. failure. It's, it's all on me. And mm -hmm. it's easier that way because, right, you only have one person to look at. You don't have to worry about the other people doing the job. And, you know, leadership as a whole is a, a whole nother topic. But mm -hmm. what do you think some of the, the cons have been? What, like, everyone looks at the, all the awesome things about being your own boss, but what were some of the hardest parts about being your own boss? So yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's one of those things that you always want to, you know, you end up not really talking about because it, it you, you do worry about coming across like you guys don't understand how hard it is to be king, <laughs> you, 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 you know, because yeah, yeah people uh, obviously, um, you know, think it must be great all the time. Um, I will say like, you know, to your point, like you, you are responsible for anything that happens or fails to happen. And I think for a lot of people, they're inclined to what fails to happen because um, you know, you gotta be a self-starter, right? And, and, um, as some people, uh, if nobody tells them, you know, what to do on Monday morning, they don't know what they're going to do all week. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. But if you are that type of person, I think you're going to not really enjoy being your own boss. Mm -hmm. Right. When I was in the army, I found myself being like, okay, I want to complete all my boss's tasks so that all the good ideas that I have, I can start working on. Right. So, um, the, the, the bad, the bad part is a couple things, you know, you get a lot of good ideas and they turn out to be bad ideas and you have to live with them. And mm -hmm. not just the fact, you know, Oh, that they didn't work, but like, sometimes you're the one picking up all the slack. Right. So sometimes you end up working 60 to 80 hours a week just so that around your 50th hour is when you start being productive. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I'll give you, I'll give you an example. We had a, a really rough time in my company where I ended up terminating three people um and essentially the same day That's right. um yeah well and when you have a company of seven people um it's most of your work guess right guess there. who's picking up those three guys jobs yeah probably not everybody probably just you mm -hmm. your own boss so now all of a sudden like you don't you know you don't really see your family even though you do have two children and da 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 right and you know i started a business with my wife now she's actually got to pick up a lot of those things right mm -hmm. So, you, you know, so that that's something that can be um, that can be very difficult about it is and another thing is that, you know, when um, relationships do go sour, which which they will when you are uh, large and in charge, mm -hmm. um, it will feel bad. It will feel very, very bad. Um, because sometimes people who, you know, maybe, uh, you have a great relationship with, you'll have a bad relationship with and, and nothing, uh, will repair it. And you will know that because you are in charge and, and you are the boss and your own boss, that it is your fault at the end of the day. Um, so I have some regret like that, that I have to live with, um, that, that comes up in my mind often. And kind of mm -hmm. like, like, I wonder if I could have done this or I could have done that or da, 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 right. Um, so I think that's a, that's a, a bit of a tough part is you do have to be prepared to work like a bandit, um, just to keep the ship together and yet not necessarily really being productive or pushing forward until, you know, your 50th or 60th hour of work that week. And by that time, it's probably not your finest hour of work. And, um, and, uh, you know, a great example is when COVID started, you know, all of a sudden we just opened up our second store in a bigger market, a way bigger store. And now like our revenues, you know, went to almost zero instantly. Yeah. And now everybody's looking at you like, you're the ideas guy. Like, what's yeah. your idea now? What yeah. are you going to do? And you're kind of like, uh, I have no idea, man. <laughs> like, 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 I have no clue. And, yeah. but somehow you're going to have to figure it out. Right. Yep. Yep. It's a, uh, that's the price of leadership, right? If you want to be in charge, if you're going to be the guy, guess what? You're the guy. If shit goes south, you're the guy. 
<laughs> yeah, man. I did. Uh, I put a little post the other day um, about leadership, and one of the things that uh, I had always heard was, or I think I heard it from Jocko Willink uh, in his book Extreme Ownership was, you know, it's not, it's all on you, but it's not about you. Mm -hmm. And I never, like, I understood it, but it never really consolidated in my head at any point in time until I was looking for pictures of my podcast actually for like title pages and stuff and uh, I found a picture of me in front of a lav overseas and I was clearing the road so I had the metal detector out and I was staring at the ground and like I was just doing my job but I realized that I was leading the convoy like I was the tip of the spear at that point that everyone was behind me mm -hmm. except for the photographer who was off on his own doing his own fucking shit <laughs> yeah <laughs> um i got a really good story about that one afterwards but the uh, cool. but i realized that it, it's not about me right all mm -hmm. the the entire convoy safety is on me but mm -hmm. it's not about me right and i would mm -hmm. rather in that moment there's many times i've said this i'd rather in that moment uh, hit something that blows me up mm -hmm. and miss something and blow cool. up somebody behind me right yeah that's not cool the regret would just be crazy yeah so but that that crystallized that whole concept for me was that it's not about me it's about them mm. <clears throat> right it's all about them all the all of the weight of the decision making and everything that's going on is on me sure but it's about them it has nothing mm. to do with me and that is uh that is a lesson that is hard learned unfortunately especially in business too right like it if all of a sudden you got no uh, revenue coming in, who's paying the paychecks? Who's yeah. covering the rent on the storefront? Who's doing uh, paying for electricity? Who's like, there's a lot of bills yeah. that come in <laughs> that your revenue oh, is supposed totally, to cover, yeah. right? And that's a, that's, that's a tough one. And that, you know, the question I was going to ask next was, you know, pacing for the long game. And that, that is so important, but to, to see this coming, like the, the whole COVID thing mm. threw everybody for a loop. I don't think anybody was really prepared for it in any way, no, except for maybe the preppers, the preppers sitting yeah. in, the, in their bathroom with their freaking gas mask on. They're like, ah, I saw it coming. <laughs> you know, yeah. but, uh, um, yeah, but for on. the average, you know, the average person there was sitting there. How do you, how do you pace for that? How do you, you know, if you want to go hard, go fast, go uh, right now. How do you pace yeah. for that 10 years down the road when you're going, you know, I want that store in LA so that I can yeah. show up. It's a good question. I, I will say that's not something I've done very well. So I had a bit of overlap between getting out of the military and starting the business, which was really great because, yeah. you know, the first two years of the business, I was, I was really fumbling around, right? There was a lot of things I didn't know um, and didn't quite understand that I've, I've figured out in terms of just making sound business models and, and, and operating structures. Um, but that meant that I was working evenings and weekends mm -hmm. and, and, and every evening and weekend, right. It went from like, okay, in the army, you know, yeah, you work hard, you play hard, but you know, we have these long leave blocks and there are these decompressed periods. Every leave block I had, I was using it as sprint times to work on my business. Right. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't set the conditions for success like that. I was really, you know, just burning the candle on both ends for, for, um, for two and a half years actually. And then, um, right before COVID we, we'd opened this second store in Waterloo, Ontario. Well, it was a lot of work in the last half of 2019. And there was a lot of travel back and forth and da 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 to get this thing going. It was very stressful. The hours were extremely long, uh, so new parents, mm -hmm. um, all that type of stuff. And then when we, we actually went to Waterloo, my wife and I for four months and we, we, you know, did a lot of the, the grunt work ourselves, um, mounting TVs, loot, hauling furniture, painting, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we did have help, uh, but we, we were right in there doing that stuff, but also trying to keep the business going in Bredesen and online, all that stuff. So, so we'd been like sprinting our faces off really for some way years, but definitely months. And then COVID came. Yeah. And then COVID was, um, was difficult because all of a sudden we had to work even harder because we were like, now we have to like, we spent all this time oriented on this store that we felt like we've picked the perfect market with the perfect product. And we really had, it really went well off the start. Then it was COVID. 
Mm-hmm. And then now we had to be like website guys, but we're also selling a product that wasn't as relevant. Well, everyone was either laid off or working from home. Yeah. It took us about two months to really, you know, figure that out, but it was a lot of hours and very depressing. And, but, it, but it worked, but then, then, you know, we were sprinting like that because we were making crazy amount of online sales and we weren't as good at shipping and fulfilling. And we had production issues and all this type of stuff. And so uh, we even, we, we, we took a vacation. It was like a one week vacation. It was the first time we'd done that in, in years, unfortunately, yeah. I have to admit. And, um, and during it, um, we got like our first bad reviews ever and like them in, in droves um, because our shipping was so delayed and yeah. we had like we were getting thousands of emails and we just weren't set up to handle it. So my wife and I would be, we were at uh, this cottage wherever and we'd just sit there while the kids were napping and just answer literally thousands of like probably about 500 emails a day. Oh. And we'd let it stack to about 10,000 emails. And we'd sit there and just listen to, you know, thousands of people tell us what idiots we were. And we'd be like, yeah, sorry about that. Oh yeah. Sorry. We're big losers. Yeah. Da, da, da. It just absolutely sucked. And then, um, you know, we had some internal problems. So I, I would actually say that pacing myself is not something I've done very well. When I did terminate those folks, I think I was telling you about that. Mm-hmm. That meant I had to pick up all their slack and yeah. I did that, but it was important to me to do that. I think uh, a lesser me might've been like, oh, well, I'll tolerate this for a little while. Cause I think some of the rebellious spirit was because they're like, yeah, well, how are you going to do this without me? And I had to do like, you know what, dude, if I could work seven days a week, I just, I will. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm here to run the show this way, not that way. And, um, but the point is I've been sprinting for a very long time and I, it's actually like a topic that's on my mind that I do need to figure out a way that I can off gas mm-hmm. and I don't see it in sight, but like, I, I kind of need to figure out a way that I can like take like a month long sabbatical with my family. And I don't, I don't know when I will or how I will, but that's, it's the, important. And if, you if it doesn't do the, happen, it could be problematic. Yeah, you could do the uh, the old school corporate for life mentality of delegate and disappear. <laughs> just like, yeah, exactly. it, it just doesn't, it just doesn't that work, work if no. uh, the government isn't paying the bills. Though. No, for sure. Absolutely. The uh, You know, it's one of the main challenges that I've had uh, as well. I, I know a lot of guys have had the same challenges. Like we come from an environment of go. Like mm-hmm. there's there is no other speed than right now all out go Mm -hmm. and the combat arms especially we have this mentality of run them until they drop and then keep going with somebody for Mm -hmm. with somebody new right and that's why we have such Mm -hmm. bad retention problems and why there's so many uh, other issues within the military right Mm -hmm. now but um because throughout afghanistan we were just you know i know a dude he was uh i met him on my plq he had five tours of afghanistan holy oh two oh four oh six oh eight like it just, and then uh, two, four, six, eight. And I think it was 10 as well. And then I did my PLQ in 12 Wow! and it was just like, and I was like, in, it was insane. He just, he would come home and he would do career courses and then he'd go back over and then he'd do career course. And then he'd go back over and then do career course and go back over. And it was just like, what the hell, man? Like what the yeah, hell? Wow. But that was the, uh, that was the mentality of the time, right? Use him. He's here. Use him. Use him. Use him. Use him. Use him. Yeah. And then unfortunately, I know a lot of guys when right before I got posted that uh, they did the same thing you did. They signed up to go to Afghanistan and they showed up and last tour was in 12, right? And then that was pretty yeah. much everywhere tore down and they were like, but, but I mean, yeah, but we went to Wainwright all the time. Yeah. They went to Wainwright all the time. Yeah. And Suffield and uh, yeah. every so often we'd go out to Dunder and out in Saskatchewan for no reason. But <laughs> um, but that mentality of just like, go, 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 but there was no that whole thing. Exactly. So unfortunately, when you get out, you, you still have that mentality and it's just like, I'm going to burn myself doing this until it either works or I die on the side of the road. Yeah. It's unfortunate. I did the same thing with the, the Canadian walk for veterans was, you know, the first couple of years I was, that was all I thought about every day, all day long. And my wife actually stopped me at one point and was like you and i are having dinner you're right like yeah yeah we are having dinner she's like you aren't here and i was like no i'm here i'm like i'm literally i'm sitting in the chair like what are you talking and she's like you're thinking about the walk 
you're talking about yeah. and i know we would do this be like oh well should we go for a trip and i'm like yeah that'd be great we can go to calgary and then i can go talk to this person for mm-hmm. for the walk and i can talk to that person and then i can go meet this person. and she's like no 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 no. like we are going for a trip you are not going on a business trip <laughs> We are yeah. going on a trip, and it, it's a it's a very difficult thing for I think a lot of us is to be able to have the business run and take a step and be like, okay, I need mm-hmm. to concentrate on family. I need to concentrate on something else other than just this. But that that pacing, you know, I've been struggling with it for years. And I, you've been struggling with it for years. It's not an easy thing to accept because when you start something it has to be a sprint, right? In order to make something successful, you have to be running that hard all the time. Yeah. Oh yeah. You need a lot of momentum at the start for sure. And there's actually not a lot of way around it. No, no, absolutely. You know, my, my parents, uh, my mom started her own business when I was her first business. I think when I was like nine, that was my Mm -hmm. first entrance into sales. I was nine years old selling uh, food products at fairs. And, Mm -hmm. um, and so I saw like business creation, work hard uh for revenue and then the business started to peter off and then that one would die and then she'd start something else and then same process and uh it was it was exhausting and like i was a kid i wasn't even involved in it i was just there to kind of sell stuff every once in a while Uh, Mm -hmm. but it is exhausting if you don't have that drive to constantly push and then Mm -hmm. you know when things go south like covid or um low sales or having to let go, let people go. You're right. It falls on you, right? You got to pick up the slack because now, so now you're sprinting while carrying a rucksack because you got everybody else's work too, right? Like it's, it's a, it's a pretty shitty position to be in. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you look to the future now, like Mm -hmm. COVID is still here, obviously, and we're still dealing with the uh, ramifications of it. Uh, We had to deal with when it came to the walk, we couldn't do any, uh, large gatherings and that was the whole mm-hmm. point of the walk was to get people out to together and walking totally. together uh but oh, we I know and I was like oh it'll be a virtual event like well cool. that's what we did you know we we leaned yeah. into it and yeah at the beginning of it I told all the team leads I'm like we wanted to add a virtual side to it so now we're going to lean into it right this is mm-hmm. where we have to go and unfortunately you know uh, I'm not sure what we're doing this year we have our AGM in the next little while so we'll make that decision soon but mm-hmm. uh it, it's a tough but it's just not little, the same no it's not the same and the whole point was to get people to get together and talk and walk and chill mm-hmm. right so that you have big groups of people that are able to do that um and hopefully make some meaningful relationships that they'll continue exactly on. right that's, that's a little bit tougher to do if, virtually you know, a bunch yeah. of us are on a screen exactly but the people that succeed in the long run are the ones mm-hmm. that can adapt and overcome. And you know, that's oh, one, of the, one of the things that we're good at, it, especially in the combat arms, we get taught that all the time, adapt and overcome, mm-hmm. adapt and overcome. Um, but for yourself, right, the future right now is up in the air, just like it is for us in the walk. Um, mm-hmm. What are your, what are your plans for the future? What do you guys got coming up? What do you guys got going on in the next little while to keep yourself rolling? Actually, we have a lot of really cool stuff that I'm super excited about. Um, we um, have always been about, about the Wild and Crazy Dress shirts. And um, what, what we did was we, we've, we've made a line of dress shirts that are, are we call our daily drivers. And they're, they're really like very Zoom economy friendly or appropriate. Um, so they have um, a lot of like cotton bamboo mixes or flannel mixes or denim mixes. So they're shirts that are just a little bit more comfortable, but still look really nice and really dressy and are really appropriate if you're kind of like, you know, have the home office set up like I do and you're kind of shirt on off uh, mm-hmm. type thing. Or, you know, you, it'd almost be too much to wear as maybe formal an outfit that I'm wearing, but you still don't want to look like a slob kind of thing. And a lot of people are in, you know, sort of that rank level and type level of work. Um, also our jeans, which is a product that we've been working on for a really long time. Um, we, I always want to do custom jeans and I think that's just like, that is the partner product to the dangerous dress shirt. Mm -hmm. So we introduced that and, and that has brought people back to our stores in a big way. Um, so we, we, and we've got actually this really cool long sleeve polo shirt coming out and a couple other really cool Mm -hmm. products that we're dropping. So we, um, we learned a lot about e-commerce and digital advertising during the, um, 
you know, the, I guess like really, really difficult part of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but what, what is, so there's two things, um, that are really getting us through this is what we've found is a lot of people are buying, um, from us now, uh, our, our shirts online, which is great because they heard about us through our masks, which, which, which blew up because people needed masks and they needed a good quality yep. mask. And we have what we call an opt out box. So when you buy a shirt from us, there's a box that's automatically checked. You have to click off it just like, you know, those terms of service boxes. Mm -hmm. And it says, Hey, someone from JC can follow up with me. And in our stores, we have huge TVs and, and, and really good quality cameras that actually like track you and stuff. And so we do these virtual consults. We call get JC in your living room, right? Nice. And so we get people to buy and we follow up with them and then we have a virtual consult with them and we help them do their measurements, whether they have a tape measure, don't have a tape measurement, no matter how lay they are. And we really get into their homes in a pretty assertive manner. And, and what's happening is we're actually building relationships with people all over America and all over this country. That's awesome. um, and, and there's people who, you know, I've helped them buy shirts. My buddies have helped them buy shirts. And, and then we, you know, they get blazers and they end up getting their whole world. And they're just talking to us in their living room and, and we're having a blast as if they're in our store. And that's mm -hmm. something that a lot of clothing companies are, are doing sort of, but they tend to do like, maybe it's on their laptop and maybe they're, you know, they're selling off the rack products to existing clients only. We're getting new people. Oh, awesome. new brand fans by going right into their living rooms and just having a blast doing it. And what is going to be so cool is one day the, um, we are going to be able to travel again. And so we're thinking we, we, what we were going to do before COVID was actually open a third store. And we were hoping that our third store would be actually in the United States. Oh, yeah. Now our online store has, um, has grown to the point where it's actually like its own store. So we're like, yeah. actually our third store is our online store. Right. And we have a, a CTO e-commerce fell in Toronto who like, that's like his baby. Right. So we've got, you know, there's the Fredericton store manager and that's his baby. There's the Waterloo store manager and that's his baby. And we've got, you know, online stores actually uh, held out of Toronto. And, um, and I actually think our, our sort of fourth store will be um, rather than a physical store, like the online store would be a little bit different. I think we'll actually, I'm considering buying like a mapped out rockstar tour bus and all these mm -hmm. relationships and connections that I am making with people through my, through my computer screen. It's being like, Hey, I know that, you know, you've got 10 friends who all like love your shirts and, and, and want you to have them. What if, what if I like roll to your city in my bus, would you bring some of them out? Right. We're also Great starting idea. to make a lot of uh, really cool brand partnerships. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think, you know, that the Canex, actually changed their mess kit shirts to our shirts, yep. right? And the Canex is 28 stores. And that has really helped us demonstrate to other brands. Um, and I've got some really cool partnerships in the works that I can't quite talk about yet, but it, it's helped demonstrate to other um, really big uh, household names that we can deliver at, at scale reliably um, with great logistics. So um, I've got a few other brand partnerships in the works that I think we'll have cemented in about the next three to six months. And those will help facilitate that type of danger tour where mm -hmm. it's like, Hey, we're, that'd be we've awesome. Got these, yeah. We've got these stops pre-planned. And what's so good about it is once these guys have been measured, it's so easy for them to just do a virtual consult or just, you know, click and buy because yep. we have the measurements that can be all personalized. They don't even need to bother coming try it on because they know it's going to be the same as their last one, right? Or they can be like, hey, I've actually gotten a little more jacked, add some more space <laughs> in the pipes. Okay, we just add a little more space in the pipes and then yeah. and then carry on and go. So so that's what's going on for us is the virtual consults and, and expanding the product. Well, that's fantastic, man. I uh, I can't, first off, I'm really looking forward to the bus. That'll be cool. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, it'll be a crazy purple paisley bus, that's I, for sure. I can't thank you enough for being on, man. I think there's some some really great points that we we covered today and some really great information for anybody listening. So thank you so much for being on. And I really appreciate you being here with me. Yeah. Th thanks a ton. If guys want to um, find me, I'm on, I'm on Facebook. It's mm -hmm. Jeff Alpa. Or if you want to look at my company, it's Jeff Alpa custom. My website is jeffalpa.com. But if, uh, if you just Google the world's most dangerous dress shirts, you'll find it. Yeah. And they are dangerous. I love them. No. <laughs> All right. Later. Bye. That concludes this episode of The Toolbox. I want to thank you for listening. 
I hope you were able to use some of the information that was offered. I want to thank all those putting it on the line for us every day. Military, veterans, first responders, and public servants. Keep up the good work. I look forward to bringing you more tools for your toolbox. And until next time, stay open, stay humble, and stay focused. Chimo. Chimo.